Asian financial crisis, 1997 and 8, right? This crisis um, followed a period of economic expansion, um, bubble, right? Bubble in the region financed by record private capital inflows. So, um, bankers from the G10 countries actively sought to finance groups, uh, uh, finance the growth opportunities in Asia by providing businesses with a full range of products and services. So, uh, 80s and 90s, right? For Korea, it's like since 1960s. It has been going through a, a prolonged economic expansion. And then, um, so, had a lot of growth opportunities. So that's why, you know, including Taiwan, Thailand, and then all these East Asian countries seemed like a great investment opportunities for Western banks. Um, and then together with that, uh, uh, we've been going through, in Asian countries have been going through real estate market bubble. And then so they were, uh, these guys uh, in the G10 countries banks, they are pouring those monies into uh, real estate in Indonesia, Thailand, and then uh, all these countries. This led to a domestic price bubbles in East Asia, particularly in real estate. Okay, so it's uh, reinforcing. Okay, but before we move on further, one thing I want to show you is want to show you is this right? Doing business with borrowed money in Korea before the crisis in 1998. Um, what do we see? What you see on the vertical axis is the debt to invested capital ratio. Debt means like a book value of debt. So invested capital is a book value of debt plus book value of equity. So, so invested capital tells you, tells us about the uh, amount or uh, uh, amount of investment financed by either debt holders or equity holders. And then the denominator or the numerator tells us about the debt financing part. So out of the whole investment, how much is coming from the debt holders pocket or bankers pocket, okay? The remaining part should be equity holders pocket. So in commonsensically, right, in doing business in rational way, right, in natural business setting, what should be the case, just like in the US, majority of your financing should, come, should usually come from your equity, okay? Um, whereas the borrowing could, would be about 20 to 30% range, right? A lot of things that drive this kind of ca optimal capital structure, I know about it, but typically the portion of debt should be low, okay? But what do you see? Before 1998 in South Korea, since 1981, I have the data, but before 1981, we don't have the data, I don't have the data. So let's plot it, the time series of this debt to invested capital ratio. Which, what, <coughs> what companies? Right, Hyundai Motor, uh, the representative South Korean Tebal companies. Uh, Hyundai Motor, <coughs> SK Innovation, SK uh, LG Holdings. LG Holdings is like what? Um, LG Sangsa kind of guys, right? Nowadays. But at that point, it was like a more, more like a trading company. Uh, and then LG, it is famous for electronics products, right? Anyway, Kia Motors and then Lotte Holding, this is a department store or confectionery kind of things in Korea. And then Hyundai Construction, right? Um, Jeongjuyong, right? And Im Young Ba, they, they were the CEOs of uh, Hyundai Construction, Hyundai Gonsol. And then Samsung Electronics, right? All of them are here, okay? That means, um, some companies like Samsung, right? This is Samsung. That's this guy. 95% of your invested capital came from bankers' money. Your capital, equity capital, only 5%, right? Samsung Jonja. That was the reality. Hungyoksa of Samsung Jonja, right? Um, heavily working with borrowed money okay um but that was not the only guy okay in, in on average they were like uh, going up and down and up and down but it's, it was like this right very high at 80 percent level right 
So four to one, as I said before. Um, at this point of time, I remember uh, my parents and their uh, met a lot of businessmen over there at that period. Okay, and then when they were talking to each other, they were t saying like, "Well, those guys who is doing their business with their own money are the stupidest guys in this world because you have easy money." from the bank the government guarantees you and then you can borrow easily from the bank so why do you do your business with your own capital equity capital come on so that was the norm during this generation okay um, so a lot of moral hazard was there the bankers money essentially that comes from the depositors that means taxpayers I saw, told you before and here one company really stood out okay yuhan corporation what is this um if you know a little bit about uh, um, about more about korean business history um yuhan or yuilhan yuhan yangheng is a very unique company in terms of corporate social responsibility um this guy yuilhan is the founder of this uh, med pharmaceutical company yuhan um, and they have a joint venture with Kimberly and they're producing some kind of tissues these days but they were producing medicines ever since um, and then they I mean this guy have been well known for social contribution and ethical management right um, and then if you look at this debt to cap capital ratio in during the 80s they were the one of the lowest uh, debt to capital ratio guys in, in this era okay uh, but even with that, it's like 30% uh, or more, or, or, or going up to 50% sometimes. Now, um, uh, if you scroll even further, here is Samsung Electronics case, right? Samsung Electronics, 81, right? And then going down to 2019, right? And then and then you see the first generation founder Lee Byung Chul, and the second generation his son Lee Gun Hee, the, the chairman of Samsung Group, up until 2015 or 14, and then after his stroke, his son took over, Mr. Lee Jae Yong over there. And what you see on this time plot is the debt to capital ratio of Samsung Electronics. Um, one interesting uh, pattern that you see is that after 1997 right their debt to invested capital ratio drastically decreased okay to about six percent level okay on recently okay um why was that the case this was not the only guy the, that not the only company that experienced this kind of drastic capital structure movement but also uh, there are a lot of korean jabbers following the case right after 1997 financial crisis Essentially, the country, uh, you know, uh, declared bankruptcy and then got the bailout money from the IMF. And then the IMF guys that came in to South Korea and then they, uh, how do you say, gave strict guidance to the uh, rules, to, you know, rules uh, attached to the money coming from the IMF, right? As long as you have this bailout money from uh, the IMF, you have to follow this rule, the, uh, the guys said. They said... The debt to equity ratio has to be less than 200 percent right since 1997 uh, 98 right um, so they had to drastically lower down the debt to capital ratio okay remember debt to equity has to be less than two times right so less than 30 percent uh, or 60% or, uh, in this case, right? Two times means uh, uh, two thirds, right? So uh, less than 60% has to be there, okay? So that's this line. So lowering down their capital ratio as a uh, debt ratio as much as possible. And uh, not only Yuhan, Yuhan Corporation, uh, but also Samsung and the, all the other guys are following the suit. By the way, uh, did I say Samsung over here? No, that's that's Kia Motors. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, my bad, but pretty much the story does not change. Anyway, um, so 
that was one important movement after the financial crisis, okay, in corporate finance uh, setting. And that, that has to do a lot to do with the, the international creditors' pressure, okay, creditors. Um, additionally, the close inter interrelationships among, uh, common among corporations like Chabars and financial institutions in South Korea, uh, in Asia, resulted in a poor investment decision making. So the banks were really, you know, lax, or they were not monitored well, not, not managed well, okay. Um, they had no worries about lending money to any corporations because those corporations were backed up by the government okay, through private connections. Okay? So credit function of the banks really sucked in Korea. Okay? Uh, this is one of the reasons I wanted to work for Bank of America instead of working for Samsung Life Insurance. Life Insurance, they also lend money to some, some corporations, right? But uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to learn a solid credit decision making in the bank in of the United States instead of Korea anyway so a uh, Asian crisis is what the only uh, is only the latest example of banks making a multitude of poor loans spurred on by competition from other banks to make loans in the hat region so uh, banks were competing to you know give loans easy money to get into the jump into uh, financial bubbles uh, in that, in those regions, right? Now, after financial crisis of 1998, I thought Lehman Brothers or Bank of America or Citibank, those guys would never go bankrupt at all um, because they looked so solid and then they had such a strong credit decision-making uh, tools over there. But that also turned out to be uh, false, right? Uh, because after 10 years, right? Um, Lehman Brothers turned out to be bankrupt and then Bear Stearns were following, I mean, the, also, you know, going busted and the Citibank and Bank of America all together, they were in the brink of collapse, right? Uh, without any government bailout money, they could have gone bankrupt uh, totally, okay? What was, the, what was the reason behind it? Well, it's all managed by humans and then the bankers keep on following the bubbles and this time, they were following the um, subprime mortgage market bubble okay, in the United States. The, officially, it began in the United States December 2007. The origin of the credit crunch can be tra traced back to the low interest rate environment created by Federal Reserve Bank in the early part of this century. So 2001, okay, the year I started my MBA uh, education, right, uh, that's September. 2001, in September 11, uh, the tragic um, event happened, which was what, 9/11, uh, and then 9/11, and then after that, together with it, um, the investors' uh, sentiment about the investing in the stock market essentially froze, uh, and then also together with it, the dot-com bubble that used to be there, um, internet dot-com bubble, bursted off. Okay, and then Enron uh, scandal bursted out. Enron scandal is a huge accounting fraud. Of course, the magnitude of fraud is even sm uh, much smaller than the fraud that we usually have in Korea. Um, but that was a huge scandal. And then the people uh, were pulling their money out of the stock market. Um, so in, on the brink of collapse, the central bank of the United States lowered down the interest rate to stimulate, the stimulus, uh, stimulate this economy, right? The low interest regime started over there, very, very low interest rate. So uh, like a near zero, near zero. So what do you do? Uh, it had an unintended consequence, even though it was a uh, boosting of the stock market. Uh, what was the unintended consequence? Well, people felt that, oh, easy money, I can borrow a lot of money without, you know, that much of a concern. Um, plus, plus, George W. Bush had some uh, policy so that everybody can own their home, okay, house, right, housing. So they were encouraging housing investment. Um, together with it, there was a securitization going on about it. And then the, uh, the government policy of uh, housing encouragement, they were ex allowing the banks to lend their money to 
uh, substandard uh, credit quality people, okay, low income people essentially, um, and then the guys, those guys, could not have been able to borrow any money before, but with the George W. Bush administration, they were able to borrow it at cheap rate, subprime mortgage we call it, and then. Um, and then that increased the demand in the housing market, increased the demand, increased the price of the housing market, right? And then if you own a house at that point of time, you feel like what? Rich and rich and richer because you're, what you own, right? The real estate that you own, the value increases like crazy, uh, two times, three times, and you feel like you know, there's a wealth effect coming on so that you invest even more, okay? either into the real estate market or into the stock market you put your money over there okay there was a significant wealth effect coming from that uh subprime mortgage bubble okay so that was what was happening until the middle of 2006 and 7 right the the origin of the credit crunch can be traced back to the low interest rate yeah that's what this is saying now uh many banks and mortgage lenders lowered their credit standards to attract new home buyers, right, uh, who could afford uh, afford to make mortgage payments at the current low interest rates or teaser rates that were uh, temporarily set at a low level during the early years of an adjustable rate mortgage, but will likely be set to a higher rate later on. So, nakshi, okay, you have to a kind of teaser rate, like. Um, Many of these home buyers would not, have, uh, would not have qualified for mortgage financing under um, stringent credit standards, nor could they afford the loan at the eventual higher rates of interest, but they just initially started it. And starting to buying it increased the demand, right? And increased the price. Um, then, these so-called subprime mortgages were typically not, uh, not held by the originating bank uh, making the loan uh, but instead was resold for packaging into mortgage-backed securities so if it were not securitization traditional lending is like between you and the bank right but there came a new scheme called securitization make it a security so that your relation the loan relation between you and the bank will be transferred to a third party so that you, your repayment actually, your loan repayment actually goes to the security holder instead of the bank that you lent you the money, okay? And then the thing is, as you securitize this thing, what happens? But you never know who will be the security owner, okay? It's going to be publicly traded, okay? When, whereas in, if it was a conventional bank lending relation, you know who is the Zhenju uh, or the owner of this money, the banker, right? You directly go there and then you know and you get directly monitored by the bank. Periodically, the banker bothers you. Hey, Mr. Andy, how are you doing? Okay, are you repaying the loan okay? How is your business going? Okay, are you really doing your business uh, uh, as you promised as before? And that kind of private monitoring is there. But securitization, you don't have that. Okay, it's public, uh, publicly traded. Okay, um, so that was that. Now, um, yeah, but instead, were we sold to packaging into mortgage-backed securities, or you call it MBS. And between two thousand one and six, the value of subprime mortgage increased from one ninety billion to six hundred billion dollars. Right, almost like three times. Okay, increased. In market size now conceptually okay conceptually speaking the uh, mortgage-backed securities make sense each MBS represents a portfolio of mortgages so uh, thus diversifying the credit risk that the investor holds so the idea of securitization okay you must have learned it from your investment class um, or financial institution class but um, basically, the securitization in the uh, you own the securitization process. Those securitizing company by forming a portfolio of loan contracts. The loan contracts not just between me and my bank, right? 
but the loan contract of thousands of different individuals, right? Thousands of different people, loan relation to different banks, right? You can consider this as a portfolio of loans, right? Portfolio of loans. So um, from the creditor's point of view, you can perceive this kind of thousands of contract as a portfolio of loans. And then out of it, some of them may be risky and others may be less risky. And then they may be less correlated with, your, with each other or not perfectly correlated with each other. Uh, so much so that they may be, their returns may be cancelling each other out. So taking, holding you, uh, bringing you back to the portfolio theory, um, you, you may be able to form an efficient portfolio of loans, right? So MBS had this kind of appeal, right? Uh, for investments uh, community. Now, uh, diversifying the credit risk that the investors hold, okay? Now, the next one, structured investment vehicles or SIVs have been on one large investor in MBS. Uh, SIV is a virtual bank uh, frequently operated by a commercial bank or an investment bank, but which operates off the balance sheet of these financial institutions. So paper company, paper bank, you can think about it. They create these paper companies and then these paper company that eventually belong to any Bank of America or um, the, what is that, the AIG kind of insurance companies. These paper companies own a lot of uh, um, MBS, okay, the security. Now, typically the SIV, an SIV raises short-term funds in the commercial paper market to finance longer-term investment in MBS and other asset-backed securities. So these paper company needs to have a balance sheet, right? And then how do we finance that? Well, by issuing you know, short-term funds in the commercial paper market. And then the assets should be those loan contracts like me and the, between me and the Bank of America and all these kind of things as asset, okay? Now, SIVs are mm, frequently highly levered with ratio of ratios of 10 to 15 times of the amount of equity raised. So the paper company's balance sheet, uh, debt to equity structure, you know that, you see, you see that, right? Highly leveraged companies, what's the risk? Interest rate risk. What if the interest rate goes up like crazy, okay? Then SIV will be in trouble, and then for, for that, you may be have, to, uh, have to, you may have to sell off your securitized uh, loan contracts or MBS and dump it into the market, which will exacerbate the uh, situation even further. So let's see. Since yield curves are typically upward sloping, okay, SIV might earn 0.25% uh, by doing this. Obviously, SIVs are subject to the interest rate risk of the yield curve inverting, okay? Uh, yield curve inversion, and you saw that before, right? Short-term interest rate bumping up like crazy, so much so that the, it, is, it may be sometimes uh, higher than the long-term interest rate. It may happen. When does it happen? Well, when the short-term business prospect is really sucks, but long-term business prospect is still okay. So re recession is coming, then the yield curve um, uh, tends to get inverted like this. The trouble is these uh, SIVs, they are heavily dependent on this short-term borrowing. So short-term rate spiking up hurts these SIVs. That's the idea, okay? Um, yeah, thus necessitating the SIVs to refinance the MBS investment at short-term rates in excess of the rate being earned on the MBS. So SIV balance sheet, if you keep on thinking about it that way, that's it. So they were exposed to too much of an interest rate risk, in the, in, in, especially the short-term rate. And then SIVs must contend with default risk if the underlying mortgage borrowers default on their home loans the SIV will lose investment value, okay? Um, of course, of course, some of you may say, didn't you say those loan contracts, thousands of loan contracts are uh, less than perfectly correlated so much so that you can achieve efficiency? Um, yes, but the trouble is, 
even though they are not perfectly correlated, they are very, very highly correlated. After all, this is the same mortgage market. And then if it, is, if it turns out to be the uh, same region or same income level, okay, of course, they will mix it. But typically, okay, the real estate itself is a one single category of asset. When bad time hits, is, as it turns out, uh, it happens together. So it rottens together. That was why there was a lot of trouble going on. Now the next one is about the uh, uh, collateralized debt obligation related to this MBS in the real estate. Collateralized debt obligations or CDOs have been another big investor in MBS. A CDO is a corporate entity constructed to hold a portfolio of fixed income assets as collateral. Okay? The uh, fixed income means like a check one, like corporate bond kind of things um, as collateral. The portfolio of fixed income assets is divided into different tranches, uh, different groups, I would say. Tranche is like a entrench or trench, uh, French language, right? Uh, tranche. Uh, eve, uh, this means group of things, um, each representing a different risk class. So AAA rated trench and then AA mi uh, minus or double B kind of uh, trenches. Right, with the different credit rating tranche existed uh, in a single CDOs, right? Um, or unrated even. CDOs serve as an important funding source for fixed income securities. A, an investor in a CDO is taking a position in a cash flows of a particular tranche and um, not in the fixed income securities directly. So the investment is dependent on uh, the metric used to define the risk and the reward of the trench investors uh, include insurance companies and mutual funds and hedge funds and other CDOs and even SIVs. So a, a lot of different investors jumped in to this CDOs backed up by this other corporate bonds and then the MBS, all these kind of things. Once the MBS is in the bubble, CDO is in the bubble as well. Uh, the trouble is all these investors were in their same basket together, all together. And then even SIVs, right, MBSs and other asset-backed securities have served as a collateral for many CDOs, right? Um, collateralized debt obligation. This is a product, complicated financial engineering product, right? Um, and then to cool the growth of the economy in 2006 and seven, right? With the wealth effect coming from the real estate market bubble, the stock market was uh, going crazy and uh, going up like crazy, right? And then the, the central bank had to cool down the economy by, uh, and then uh, that means hiring the, uh, the heightening the interest rate, increasing the interest rate or Fed funds rate, okay? Um, and then from a low, per, low of one percentage point, in 2003 to 5.25% at the, in the middle of 2006, right? So in turn, mortgage rates increased, okay? Fat funds rate increased, the base rate increases, the rest of the rates increases even, for even more. So the mortgage rates increased, many subprime borrowers found it difficult, of course, right? Um, if not impossible to make mortgage payments in a cooling economy, slowing down the recession uh, it is causing and then especially they try to be careful not to say recession but especially i mean essentially they try to say slowing down or smooth landing kind of things um, especially when their adjustable rate mortgages were reset at higher rates now um, high interest rate risk they are exposed commonly altogether when the subprime uh, debtors began defaulting on their mortgages, commercial paper investors were unwilling to finance SIVs, right? Um, liquidity world essentially dried up, okay? The liquidity dry up, and then nobody wants to sell or buy this uh, MBS or CDO, right? Liquidity dry up means like no transaction, okay? Because they are all scared out. Okay, uh, scared off, right? 
the spread between the three months euro dollar rate and uh, three months uh, treasury bill rate okay we call it TED spread uh, frequently used as a measure of credit risk increased from about uh, 30 basis points or 0.3 percentage point in March 2007 to 200 basis points in November 2007 as investors became fearful of replacing funds in even the strongest international banks. Um, additionally, many CDOs uh, found themselves stuck with the highest risk tranches of MBS debt, which they had not only not yet placed or were unable to place as subprime flow foreclosure rates around the country escalated. Um, and then as the subprime foreclosure rates around the world country escalated commercial and investment banks have been forced to write down um, the uh, write down the over 170 billion dollars of subprime debt to date uh, with as much as 285 billion dollars expected okay uh, now um, the lessons of uh, global financial crisis right uh, the story of the global financial crisis is still ongoing uh, pretty much done okay but we have another crisis by the way many lessons should be learned from it credit rating agencies need to refine their models for evaluating esoteric credit risk created in MBS and CDOs I told you about this right um, this right there were a lot of guys coming from SNP rating agencies they had not much of an idea just like me, right? Um, were they studying harder? I hope, but it seems like they were not, okay? Um, borrowers must be more wary of putting complete faith in credit ratings, um, right? So you have to watch out for that. Rating agencies, don't believe them too much, or the analysts, or supposedly experts, right? They don't know either, man. Mathematicians, engineers, well, they give the impression that they are super mind of everything. Like, like a engineering training give you some wrong impression or you hypnotize yourself as if you are the ruler of the world. Mathematicians rule the world. Good luck. Doesn't happen. Okay. Um, but those people who are not good at math are intimidated by that math so that oh mathematicians you must be ruler of the world and we follow you whatever you say no okay um, so borrowers must be more wary of putting complete faith in credit ratings bankers seem to cr scrutinize credit risk less closely when they serve only uh, as mortgage originators rather than the paper holders themselves um, and then as things have turned out when the subprime mortgage crisis hit commercial and investment banks found themselves exposed in one fashion or another to more mortgage debt than they realized they held so um, your portfolio turned out to be not as much diversified and you are all together screwed together right and concentrated on those CDOs all together which is not good okay um, the rest of the slides are self-evident you see it is yeah, the summaries and all those things so if you have any questions later please email me at the following address down there right okay and I hope you enjoyed my lecture and then see you later Bye.